Welcome to the Reach Podcast with your pastor, Philip Jackson. We're in a series of lessons where we're looking at uh, we're looking at relationships. We're looking at how God relates to us, and we're doing that as we explore the book of the Song of Songs. And there are um, there's a number of things that we've talked about. We've talked about. Uh, the necessity for us to to know what authentic, real relationships are. If you remember when we started this this series, I told you about uh, agents who work for the Treasury Department, and the way that they train them to spot counterfeit currency is that they spend all of their training time studying authentic, real bills, and they do that so that. Whenever they do encounter something that is counterfeit, they can spot even the most minor discrepancies. So as you all are navigating young adult life, as you're thinking about your future and what relationships might hold and what what it might look like to be maybe one day married to somebody or have a deep relationship with somebody, everything that the world promises you is counterfeit. Everything. And the way that we know what to shoot for is to be acquainted with the target. So as we study God's word in Song of Songs, what we're doing is that we are evaluating what it means to be in a relationship, a real relationship, a relationship that is built to last. There are a lot of people who are commentators about relationships, and they love to give good advice about relationships, but everything seems to fall short. And I've told you before, I am not a Google theologian. Um, When we study God's word, we are going to open up a passage and we're going to dig as deep as we can. And we're going to work our way through in a disciplined way to understand what God's word says about key fundamental truth. That means that we don't do a whole lot of topical series here at Reach. We want to take a text and we want to go 10 miles deep to understand what God's word says so that we can apply it to our lives in a real practical way. Um, What we're going to cover tonight is we're going to cover... uh, chapters 3 through all of chapter 4, and then the first verse of chapter 5. But before we get to that, it's important for me to lay out some some cultural context for you, okay? This is a book that we went through as a staff a number of years ago. It's called Blessed Are the Misfits. It's a guy written by a guy named Brant Henson. Uh, Hansen, sorry. Um, he is a, a radio personality, writer, um, and uh, he gives a description in this book of what uh, the marriage process would have looked like. So if we're looking at Song of Songs, remember we have our three main characters, the three main personalities in the book. We have, we have the king, we have Shulamith, who is the shepherdess, and then we have the shepherd, the lover, who is off in the mountains, right? We talked about him being a man of adventure last week. Let me explain this to you. Uh, I'll read this to you, just a couple of short pages, and then we'll get into the text. When Jesus was sharing his last supper with his friends, he wasn't having a Passover meal. He was proposing. This sounds bizarre, but there's no mistaking it. A little background. In their culture at that time, marriage happened in stages. There was a betrothal, which was legally binding, often at least a year before the wedding uh, happened. They would not live together during the betrothal period or consummate their marriage. They were together, yet set apart. We see this in the story of of Mary and Joseph in the, in the, the nativity story. He continues on, he says, through our own modern lenses, the betrothal process might seem odd, but it's intriguing. Here's how it happened. First, it was common for a father to choose a bride for his son. The bridegroom would then come to the home of the woman his father had chosen. To her family, he would, pre- he would then present an offer, a covenant, an agreement proposing marriage, including a price he was willing to pay to her family for her. The price was an indication of the value that he placed on the woman that he wanted to marry. It didn't work the other way around. The bride's father didn't have to pay a thing. The cost was borne by the groom and his father. In her family, if her family accepted, the groom would pour a glass of wine for her. And now it was squarely upon her. If she accepted, she would would reach for the cup and drink. The delighted groom would then follow by drinking from the same cup. They would be betrothed. This meant they would be legally bound and the two had become one. The bridegroom would then tell her that she was sanctified unto me by the law of Moses and Israel. But the marriage would not be consummated, not yet. 
Before the groom left, he would leave her with gifts as a way of remembering her, of reminding her that she was bought for a price. Now he betrothed, now betrothed in a new covenant with him. He would then go home and tackle his next project. He would build a place for them, a honeymoon suite, usually in his father's house. No doubt he would think of his beloved the entire time he was building, however many months rolled by in the period of together yet apart. Much as he might yearn for her, he couldn't be married until the construction was ready, and he didn't get to determine that. His father would let him know when it met his specifications. Only then, it could be a year or two, might the groom hear the words he'd been waiting for. It's time. Go get your bride. Meanwhile, the bride would be thinking of him. She would be spending her time preparing, along with her friends, for the wedding. She would wear a veil in public and otherwise signify that she'd accepted a man's offer. I wonder if sometimes in the interim she struggled with doubt. Was this really going to work? Had she made the right choice? What about the other options? Had she felt anything for him? Would she ever? Had he even been real? Had she just dreamt it? Yes, she was fully committed, but understandably eager for the period of together yet apart to finally end. When the bridegroom's father told him he was ready, he and his party would make their way to the bride's home. While she would have an idea that his coming was imminent, she and her friends wouldn't know exactly when it would happen. He would signal his coming with a loud blast of a shofar, a ram's horn, and then he and his party would arrive for the bride and her bridesmaids. The crowd would then excitedly make their way to the groom's father's house. The couple would go into the newly built honeymoon chamber. When the groom announced to his groomsmen that the marriage had been consummated, a week-long party would start. Lots of food, lots of dancing, and an abundance of celebration. It concluded with a massively festive grand finale feast with two stars of the show, the groom and his bride, the wedding feast, at last. And finally they were together and no longer apart. This is a picture of what God has promised us through the prophecy and through the word of Jesus that will happen to us one day when we come to the marriage feast of the Lamb. There's a couple things about this scripture that I need, to, I need to go over first before we get into the text itself. The first is in the Hebrew language that's used in verses 6 through 11 in chapter 3, it's not quite clear who's speaking. Some, some scholars say that it is uh, Solomon, some say that it's a narrator, but either way you slice it, there's a definite break from the voice in the previous verses, and scholars are not really sure who's speaking, whether it's an observer or the man or the daughter of Jerusalem or whoever, but they're going to give us some commentary. The second thing is that there is no direct reference to Solomon as a historical person in these verses. Remember, if you're, if you're, if you're uh, familiar with what we talked about in the first uh, lesson, Song of Songs is his proper name. The reason why Solomon is typically mentioned in this book is because Solomon is a, uh, he's a figure that signifies wisdom literature within Hebrew culture. And so when it says the Song of Solomon, it means the choicest song, the best song. And so Solomon is a picture here. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why. We'll get into that when we get into the text. Um, this is one of the most difficult portions of Scripture to interpret. Um, the language in this text is going gonna, is gonna to refer, it seems to be more about the grandeur of a wedding uh, than less about a specific person. And then finally, the last thing is that this is another section of Song of Songs that, holo- that highlights this is a collection of songs and not one continuous narrative. We're going to be dropping in and out of this dialogue back and forth, and uh, we're not necessarily following a continuous narrative. So make, make sure that you don't make the mistake as we're reading through. Okay, take your Bibles, turn over to... Uh, Song of Songs, chapter 3, we're going to be in verse 6, and I, I don't have points for you, um, that's not the way that we, we're able to break up this text, so uh, do your best, just write down your thoughts, and if we need to talk about it later, we can. Beginning in verse 6, he begins by saying this, Who is coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke, as rising incense of myrrh and frankincense, with all scented powders of the merchant? The image here of, is of dust on the horizon, beginning to pour over a path. There's a crowd coming. There's a disturbance on the road coming from the wilderness. Remember in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, we saw the groomsmen coming from the wilderness. We see the focus of our attention coming from the wilderness, the place of Shulamith's lover. The word for smoke here can also be described as dust being kicked up on the road. The idea is that there is a large party on the move. 
The fragrance of myrrh that's discussed here in verse 6 has already been discussed in, in chapter 1. But frankincense is new. We haven't seen frankincense yet. This is an interesting element. Because frankincense was used throughout the Bible as, a, as the key element of holy events. It was common for God uh, to be commanded by God for them to incorporate frankincense into the offerings of the Israelites. It is also one of the famous gifts given to Mary and Joseph by the Magi in Matthew 2 to Jesus. In other words, frankincense is a picture of sacrifice. So before we can even see what's coming, we see that there is a disturbance on the road, and we can see that there's commotion, that something is coming from the wilderness, and we can smell the smell of sacrifice. Someone important is coming. Let's move on to, to verse 7. Behold, it is the traveling couch of Solomon, 60 mighty men around it, of the mighty men of Israel. All of them are those who seize the sword, learned in war, which man has his sword at his side, guarding against the dreadful things of the night. King Solomon has made for himself a sedan chair from the timber of Lebanon. He made its posts of silver, its back of gold, and its seat of purple fabric, with its interior inlaid with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. He continues on to describe this litter as it comes over the horizon. This is a royal procession, a royal wedding procession, complete with guards and elaborate colors and embroidery. First, we notice that he makes reference to Solomon's royal litter. This is, a, this is an homage, not necessarily that Solomon is in the coach itself, but that it is a kingly mode of transportation. Other parts of Scripture describe the, crown of, the, the throne of God as a chariot set on wheels. The prophet Ezekiel prophesies that one day when God does enter into creation to set things right, that he will do so in the most spectacular way. What we see here is a picture of Jesus coming for his bride in the fullness of time. The litter is accompanied by 60 warriors from mighty Israel who carry swords and are skilled in battle. These, are men, these men imply the protection that's common for royalty and the authority that the groom brings with him. A picture of the power of the groom of the church, perhaps. So the description continues in verse 9, that King Solomon made for himself a sedan chair from the timber of Lebanon. This is an homage to the, uh, the strength of the cedars of Lebanon. These are the same timbers that Solomon used to build the temple. What he's saying is that this, this, this is a well-made coach. Verse 10, he made its posts of silver, its back of gold, and its seat of purple fabric, with its interior inlaid with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. His carriage shows the elegance and the extravagance of the pending wedding. It's important to notice here that the position of honor in ancient weddings was not the bride. It was the groom. We get this backwards in modern culture. What do we see? We see everyone waiting, waiting up front, and the bride comes down the aisle. Everybody stands and they turn and they look. This is something that every girl dreams about, right? The day that I'm going to be a bride. But in the ancient world, the groom was the person of honor. Now, think about it this way. If you go to a modern wedding, we see a picture of the post-returned king. You see, Ephesians tells us that Husbands are supposed to love their wives as Christ loved the church and present her to him, to the Father, as an excellent sacrifice. The idea is that one day, in the fullness of time, that God will gather all of his children together, his bride, the church, and he will present the church to the Father, to heaven, to celebrate what God has done in redeeming creation. So what we see in weddings today is we see a bride being shown off, being displayed, and we see the consummation of an actual union between two people. That means that, that the picture of what we know as a wedding, it has to be seen in the proper context. The groom represents the promise of Christ and is mentioned in Scripture as the groom of the church. Look at verse 11. The daughters of Zion, they begin to, uh, to comment. Go forth and see, O daughters of Zion, King Solomon, with the crown with which his mother has crowned him on the day of his wedding. And on the day of the gladness of his, uh, and on the day of his gladness of heart, the ladies are called to gaze on the groom and appreciate him and the sweetness of the impending wedding. 
It says in the book of Philippians that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. There will come a day whenever we will stand in heaven and we will see Jesus in all of his fullness and we will drop to our knees and we will gaze upon his holiness. And we will celebrate who he is as the groom of all creation. What the scripture is telling us is that these ladies are are drawn to him. By drawing their attention to the groom here, the poet is showing us the significance of the groom and his significance in the eyes of his bride. We will look on Jesus in a fullness of time, and we will appreciate not just who he is in his character and in his being, but also what he has done for us as our Savior. It mentions the groom's mother here, that she's mentioned Uh, much like the mother of Shulamith in the previous chapter, to to show another image of her place in the matchmaking culture of the day. It's also symbolic of the relationship between the woman playing a key role in in the redemption of creation through their son, Jesus. You see, back in Genesis chapter 3, when God issues the curses to the woman, he makes her a promise. He says, from your descendants, I will redeem creation. And your seed, capital S, will crush the head of the accuser. Many, many generations later, Mary would, be con- would conceive a child through the, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and she would give birth to the Savior of all creation. And I wonder, in my sanctified imagination, I wonder if Eve, the woman who carried the blame for all of creation, was standing against the banisters of heaven, watching Mary give birth to the Savior of the world. And the father looks at Eve and he says, baby girl, look. I told you, your daughter giving birth to the Savior. Eve and Mary, once again, placed the crown on his head because of the fullness of his promises. So the groom addresses his bride. Look at these first seven verses of chapter 4. He says, Behold, you are beautiful, my darling. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Your head is like a flock of goats. They have leapt down from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of newly shorn ewes, which have come up from their washing, all of which bear twins, and not one of them has lost her young. Your lips are like a scarlet thread, and your mouth is lovely. Your temples are like a slice of pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with rows of stones of which are hung 1,000 shields, all the small shields of the, of the mighty men. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle, which feed among the lilies. Until the day breathes and the shadows flee, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh, to the hill of frankincense. Okay, you, man, you ladies, you hear, hear a guy talk to you like that, you're going to get excited, right? He says, behold, you are beautiful, my darling." Notice that the groom doesn't come on her with force. He doesn't tell her, this is what we're going to do. This is who we are going to be. This is, this is where we are going to go. He starts off with a simple acknowledgement of who she is. And he sets her at ease. Guys, you know, one of the things that uh, these ladies want more than anything is just to be seen as a person. To be like, hey, you're my friend. How are you doing? And that's it. He says, you are beautiful, my darling. That's the same word that we've seen over and over again. It means my precious friend, my sweet companion. He tells her that she's beautiful twice. Perhaps he knew that she questioned her beauty. She's his darling, his dear friend. He begins his description of his love by starting at the top of her head and working his way down her body. He says that her eyes are like doves behind a veil. Like before, he describes her look as kind, that her eyes are soft and they are sweet and that she sees goodness in the world. And when she looks at him, she's at ease and she's safe. The eyes are the window to the soul. He says, your hair is like a flock of goats that have leapt down from Mount Gilead. Now that's great. I love that line. Now, what he's talking about here is her hair is flowing like a flock of goats. Now, back in the ancient world, in, in Palestine, most of the goats, uh, they don't look like our goats, okay? They have long black hair that shines in the sun. So what he's saying is, if you picture in your mind's eye, okay, a mountain range, and you see a flock of goats as they run down the mountain range, 
and their shiny black fur bounces in the sunlight, what he is saying is he's saying, sweetheart, your hair, it cascades down your head and onto your shoulders in beautiful, glimmering sunlight. Man. He says, you are gorgeous. Verse 2, your teeth are like a flock of newly shorn ewes which have come up from their washing, all of which bear twins, and not one of them has lost their young. He's, he's talking about her teeth. He says her teeth are like a flock of newly shorn sheep. That's another great line. This doesn't mean that her teeth are fuzzy. It means that they're white and in order, that they're not missing any, right? Have you guys ever seen those pictures of celebrities where they black out their teeth? If you haven't, you should Google it because it's hilarious. Like, you think these people are the most attractive people in the world? Take away their teeth. They got nothing, right? He says, sweetheart, your smile is sweet. Um, she's got a beautiful smile. He says, your lips are like a scarlet thread and your mouth is lovely. Back then, small lips were the in thing. Okay, now it's like the whole duck lip thing. <laughs> Back then it was like, the thinner the lips, the better. He said, I know, it is weird, right? <laughs> he, says, he says, your lips are thin like a cord. They're, they're like a scarlet thread. They're beautiful, right? He says, your temples are like a slice of pomegranate behind your veil, her brow, or her temple or her cheeks um, are flush with blood. As her lover describes her, she's beginning to blush as he makes his way down her body. As the blood begins to fill her cheeks, she begins to react to what he's saying. Verse 4, your neck is like the Tower of David built with rows of stones. This is really important. Remember, we talked about earlier how he described her as a thoroughbred, as a beautiful Beautiful woman that distracts others. In the ancient world, a person's neck was a symbol of character. A person with a bent over neck was thought to have been humiliated. Someone with a stiff neck was thought to have been proud. But his comment about her neck, it points to her strength and her poise. One writer put it this way. He said, the Tower of David was a military fortress of the nation. The country depended upon the, the faithfulness and integrity of that fortress. Therefore, when the king likens the neck of his bride to the fortress... He is paying her a great compliment. The way she carries herself reflects an integrity and character that breeds a healthy respect from all who see her. She's strong. and She's beautiful. She is a warrior bride. On the tower, he describes it, that, it, that on which hung a thousand shields, all the small shields of the mighty men. It's decorated by the shields of those who swore allegiance to the king. In other words, her neck portrays the strength and is a symbol of her good reputation. He's describing her community that stands with her. This uncovers a key truth, that a godly partner will not see your community as competition for your relationship. They will see it as an advantage because it means that there is an infrastructure ready to strengthen your joint pursuit of Christ. If you were in a relationship and that person that you're in a relationship with wants you to neglect godly friendships... They are a bad influence on you. If your significant other that you're spending time with would rather hang out by, your, by, by yourselves than go and being with God's people, that person is a trap. That person is hunting you. They're making you vulnerable. First John tells us that if we love God, we will love his people. And that means that if we neglect being with his people, not only are we defying the commandment to not forsake the assembling of believers from Hebrews, but we also what that means is that we are setting ourselves up for failure. Because remember, if you ever watch those nature shows, which antelope gets eaten? The one that's by themselves. So if you are in a relationship and that person does not think your community is a valuable piece of your life, run away as quickly as possible. Verse 5, he says, your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle, which feed among the lilies. He describes her breasts as two fawns in a field of lilies. This is uh, speaking about her innocence and how she's attractive, how she is not to be manhandled, but to be gently and tenderly taken care of. His comment about twins of a gazelle points to the vulnerability of young deer with their mother. He's acknowledging the, the vulnerability of that it will take for them to be together physically, that she will have to expose herself to him and him to her, that this is not something to be uh, grasped and to be forced. The world tells us that, that 
uh, sexual love or physical love is meant to be uh, adventurous and dangerous and exciting and all these things. But God's word says that it's, it is not about any of those things. There will always be a passion. There will always be a tension with passion, but never at anyone's expense. The world tries to tell us that this is something that is good and healthy, but it's not. It is not hot. It is dangerous. Verse 6, he says, Until the day breeze and the shadows flee, I will go my way to the mountain of myrrh, to the hill of frankincense. He tells her that they will make love all night. and He longs for her to consummate their love. The mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense represent here an image of Shulamith's body. The, frank, the fragrances mentioned above have been used to describe sensual, the sensual sense of lovemaking. He tells her again that she's beautiful and that he cherishes her. Look at verse 7. You are altogether beautiful, my darling, and there is no blemish in you. This is the seventh, seventh uh, description of her in this passage. Seven is a symbol of perfection in the Bible. It points to uh, God's attributes. And so he finishes here a list of seven attributes. And after giving a description of her seven greatest features, the groom summarizes his observations of the phrase, there is no imperfection in you. This phrase is only used 18 times in Scripture. And it's generally reserved for the description of the animal's that met the standard for worship and atonement. He sees that she is the product of sacrifice. He tells her again that she's beautiful. Now, there's a dual picture here. Remember, we have a tension here as we're reading this text. One is that we have the picture of a relationship between a man and a woman and the covenant relationship of marriage. And then we also have the other dual purpose, the dual picture of Jesus and his relationship with the church or God's relationship with mankind. And so what we can see through, as we're looking at these, these characteristics about how the groom sees his bride is twofold. The shepherd is acknowledging the perfection of his bride after examining her. Also, there will come a day when we will stand before God and he will examine us. Through the gracious sacrifice of Jesus, he will tell us the same thing after examining us. But only for those who trust Christ. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, the day will come when you will stand before God's throne and he will examine you. And if there is no groom to stand beside you, to be your advocate, you will stand there alone. And the reality is this that those who are not part of the wedding party will not be included in the wedding feast. That's a sobering thought because in our generation, we want everybody to be included. Everybody gets a trophy. Everybody gets a celebration certificate. Everybody gets awarded something special. But here's the thing. If we don't have Jesus, we have nothing. And so to be, to be invited into the, the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, we've got to be in the bridal party. So when the day comes and you were examined by God, and he says, this is the order of your life. This is how you've lived your life. This is what you've trusted in. I see all along the way you've trusted in yourself because you are that smart, that tough, that strong, that good looking. But you have nothing. I'm sorry. Your name isn't on the program. That's a sobering thought. And if you don't know Jesus, you need to know him. Look at verse 8. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. May you come with me from Lebanon. Journey down from the top of Amana, from the top of Sinir and Hermon, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of leopards. He invites her to come with him from Lebanon, which is in the north, to the mountains of Amana and Samir and Hermon. These rest on the northern end of Israel. He's inviting her to come away with him to take her, to leave her home and to leave her fears, the lions and the leopards behind. This is the first mention of her calling her his spouse. Now, before they consummate their marriage, he invites her to join him on an adventure. Remember, we talked about that the purpose of marriage is you have a man and a woman who have been called to an adventure together. That he has been called to lead her into unknown places to chase Jesus together. That they are, they were, they are equal in strength and equal in, in purpose but different in application, and God's going to use them as a team to build a life together. Verse 9, he says, You have made my heart beat faster, my sister, my bride. You have made my heart beat faster with a single glance of your eyes, with a single strand of your necklace. 
The groom transitions from praising her beauty and now describes the effect that she has on him. He says, you captured my heart. It means that she has taken possession of his will. He calls her his sister because in their culture, a sister is an affectionate term for someone that you love. Charles Spurgeon said this. He says, as if he could not express his his near and dear relationship to her by any and one term, he employs the two, my sister. That is one by birth, the partaker of the same nature, and my spouse, that is one in love, joined by sacred ties of affection that never can be snapped. My sister by birth, my spouse by choice, my sister in communion, my spouse in absolute union with myself. Verses 7 through 9 speak to her safety with him. She is more than just a lover. She sees his responsibility to love her as a serious and precious commitment. Here's the thing, ladies, is that if God has called the men to lay down their lives for you, to lead you into an adventure, that means that you must not take advantage of their courage. There are many ladies who would love to get free things from guys who love to get free things, love to get doted upon and wined and dined and strung along. God help you if you take advantage of a godly man. Because this is something that is very, very serious. A godly man who is willing to give up everything about himself in order to serve you and then for you to go and abuse that for your own advantage is shameful. We all have a responsibility to see the commitment of each other. Verse 10, he says, How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of oils than all kinds of spices. The praise of Shulamith's love is a reminder that that she is not a passive recipient of his love. She actively desires him as well. He says that her desire is much more than wine. The same thing is said about his love in in chapter 1, verse 2. One commentator said this, he said, the sense of the, of the cologne is not that her perfumes are better than any others, but that to her lover, even her everyday anointing oils smell better than the most exotic perfumes. She's intoxicating to him. He says, your lips, my bride, drip honey from the comb. Honey and milk are under your tongue, and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. Well, it turns out that the French may not have invented the French kiss, because it's written right here, and it's written... 4,000 years ago. In the ancient world, milk and honey were an idiom that meant, that meant abundance. He's saying that her kisses are abundantly sweet. These are passionate kisses. He's not, she's not pecking him on the cheek. The word used for garments is commonly used to describe the outer cloak that would be used to, uh, you, typically in, in the ancient world, they would have an, uh, an ephod, a linen cloak that they would go, one piece that would go from the top of their shoulders down to their, their ankles about right here, and they would have an overcoat. That overcoat would have a couple of different purposes. One would be to, they would wear it during the day, and they also would use it as a blanket at night. So when he makes a reference to her garments, like the fragrance of Lebanon, he's saying, he's, he's, he is talking about when they're in bed, covered up, whether covers. And given the context, he's commenting on the smell of her bed. And here's where the consummating begins. Verse 12, a garden locked is my sister, my bride, a rock garden, a a garden locked, a spring sealed up. He refers to her virginity and purity as he describes her sexuality as a locked garden, a sealed spring. This invokes familiar imagery from Proverbs chapter 5 that we read in our first lesson about the importance of sexual integrity within within a relationship A garden is neither common ground nor ground for the planting of things at random, nor is it a ground for merely agricultural purposes, but for the production of something for beauty and for pleasure, writes one writer. The idea of a secret garden or a locked garden is privacy. The maiden's sexuality was to be privately expressed. That's the thing is that he is saying that this is something that is so precious that it's something that we must protect the integrity of. We don't advertise this. This isn't just something that we we put on display anywhere. This is something that is precious just for us, just for the two of us. The other idea of this garden is that it suggests separation. Her sexuality was to be focused on and set apart for her beloved. One writer said, a garden, a garden indeed, but she was not a public garden. Another point of this garden suggests that it was sacred, that it was something holy that she had set apart. Another thing is that it suggests security. 
that she was to be respected and not violated even by the beloved. It was only to be expected in the context of security. The idea is that this locked garden is a place that's sacred. Now, there's some excellent thoughts from commentators about this verse, but there's also some potential lies for our, from our culture. Let's talk about some myths. The Bible says nothing about premarital sex. That's a lie. We've already talked about many times in, the, in Scripture of Song of Songs to not awaken love before the appropriate time. The fact is that Scripture places a high value on virginity. It's seen here in this passage and other passages like Deuteronomy 22. It shows that premarital sex is wrong, but it also clearly is found in the passages that speak against sexual sin in the New Testament. The word in the New Testament that's used for sexual sin or fornication is the Greek word pornonia. That's where we get the word pornography. The idea is that sexual immorality, fornication, is ungodly, and it is not healthy for us. It has poisoned us. It encompasses every practice of sexual behavior outside of marriage. Another myth, he wants to have sex with me because he loves me. That is not true. Not true. His love for you will be proved by his willingness to wait for marriage. The desire for sex does not prove love in a man. This blew my mind, okay? Listen to this. In one survey, 55% of men said yes to the following question. If you could be certain that your wife or girlfriend would never know, would you have sex with any of her friends? The answer is yes. How about another question? Have you ever had sex with a woman you have actively disliked? 58% of men said yes. Ladies, you are foolish to think that if a boy loves you or even likes you, it's because he wants to have sex with you. Third myth. My boyfriend is a Christian and he loves the Lord. I don't have to worry about that. False. Christian men face the same challenges as non-Christian men when it comes to sexual desires and lusts. They have the ability to overcome those lusts by the power of the Holy Spirit. But it isn't easy, and many who thought they were strong enough have fallen in these sins. Man, myth number four. We're going to get married, so it doesn't matter. False. I know people who are engaged, and the engagement doesn't work out. If you do premarital counseling with me and with Lindsay, the very first question I will ask you if you sit on my couch is, are you having sex with each other? The very first question. Just is what it is. You want to take the religious part, throw it out. Statistically, you are more likely to get divorced and also have a premarital, uh, a extramarital affair if you have sex before marriage. It's just a fact. It does matter. A couple of things about this. First, you're setting a value on your own sexuality. There's a sense in which a woman then gives her future husband the right to treat her as an object. Second point, that you're setting a pattern. You are agreeing that in some circumstances, sex outside of marriage is acceptable. And this is something you don't want in your mind or in the mind of your marriage partner, especially because one of, one of the most important aspects of it is long-lasting. Fulfilling the sexual relationship is trust. Third, You are only taking away from the blessing God intends for your sexual relationship when you're married. Something that we don't realize, that you don't realize in your ignorance being a single person, is that everything that you do before you get married gets carried into your marriage. Everything. That's not just with the person that you end up marrying, that's also with the people that you've been with before you're married. That means that if you compromise yourself while you're engaged, you carry those compromises into your marriage. And you might say, oh, well, you know, it's going to be fine. We're going to get married. It's all going to be fine. We've, made our, we've confessed our, our sins to the Lord. Everything's fine. But if you have not gone through the proper steps of working through those situations and what you've done, you have laid a foundation for the future to where the other compromises are not as difficult. The next myth We can be married before God. All we need to do is just tell God we want to be married and he'll marry us. Yes, that's how this works. No, it's not true. 
Now, if you were on a, on a desert island and there was no government, no priest, no pastor, nobody else there with you, just the two of you, now we can kind of make that argument. But it's not a reality. It doesn't matter what you do, what you say to each other. Marriage is about standing in front of a congregation of people who, know, who love you and will hold you accountable, and you say that we want our life to display the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. Will you hold us accountable in our relationship? There's a wedding that I went to last year. I thought it was brilliant. When the, when the groom and the bride, when they took the stage, they didn't face away from the crowd. The pastor stood on the floor in front of the steps, and they turned and they faced the crowd. And they gave their vows facing their accountability, not hiding behind a veil. Marriage is about publicly stating a fact about your life. This is what I'm committing myself to. Because the purpose of marriage is to display the gospel. Look at verse 13. Your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits, henna with nard plants, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all these trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, along with all the finest spices. Her lover describes her garden as a paradise full of all the choicest fruits and spices. All of these spices are used as perfumes. The imagery describes strong smells, tastes, and touches of his bride. Verse 15, you are a garden spring, a well of fresh water, and streams flowing from Lebanon. If you remember from Proverbs chapter 5 that water is a symbol of life. It's a symbol of, of, of vitality. He says that our love is a spring. This is not something that is common. This is not gutter water. This is something that holds the power of life. Look at verse 16. Last verse. Awaken, O north wind, and come, wind of the south. Make my garden breathed out fragrance. Let its spices flow forth. May my beloved come into his garden and eat its choice fruits. Just like the trees emit a fragrance in the wind in the spring, she calls her lover to stir her garden for love. Notice that the possession of her garden has changed in this verse. It's no longer her garden. She calls it his garden. This highlights the words of the Apostle Paul where he says to the, to the church at Corinth that sexual sin is different than any other sin because it's a sin against a whole person. When we sin sexually, we sin against ourselves. And the thing is, when you're married to someone what you do to yourself affects your spouse. Same thing is true in a dating relationship. If you think that you can date someone free of sexual sin and then continue to watch pornography and masturbate, that it's not going to affect your relationship, you're wrong. Because it will. It'll poison how you see that other person. It'll poison the way that you trust them and the way that you speak to them, the way that you manipulate them. Our hormones have a way of manipulating other people to the point of sinfulness. Sexual integrity matters. There's a reason why I don't talk a whole lot about purity. Purity is about not doing something. Integrity is about building something that will last. Okay? When I focus on building sexual strength and sexual integrity, I'm focused on how am I preparing myself sexually for the benefit of my spouse. If I told you, don't think about a pink elephant, what are you all thinking about? A pink elephant, right? Well, don't watch porn. Don't masturbate. Don't do that. It's bad for you. Don't do it. Can we see how this is a bad recipe? <laughs> right? What if instead we focused on building our lives on truth and not trying to prevent things that we're naturally drawn to? I focus on building strength to build strength. Right? Right? I can't say I don't want to get any weaker, so I'm just not going to go to the gym. I'm just going to not move. It's kind of dumb, right? The application of truth brings strength. I'm building integrity. So she has given him possession of her garden. It underscores the importance of choosing a spouse who's going to respect you sexually. She invites her lover to explore her body and all of its choicest fruits. We've run out of time, so we can't go further in depth there. Here's something that I want to leave you with. I've already gone long. We'll finish this up when we can. 
there are things that our culture wants to tell you about your relationship, the future of your relationship, and what it means to be in a healthy relationship. And everything that the world tells you is wrong. Because everything the world tells you and teaches you is about your own selfish gratification. Everything is about what I can get out of a relationship. Okay, how is this person going to make me happy? How is this person going to complete me? And as a result, what we do is we, we project ourselves and we say, I'm going to try to find the right person. How many of you have realized that that's a terrifying and impossible feat to find the perfect person? Right? Like pretty much everybody's like, bingo, that's it, right? So what if instead of focusing on finding the right person, we start, decide, and I know this is a cliche, but instead we try to make ourselves the right person. It's not about who you're, who you're supposed to be with. It's, in fact, it's not even about, who you're, about what you're supposed to do with your life. It's about who God has called you to be. And if you find your satisfaction in the real bridegroom, guess what, ladies? He knows what's best for you, and if he wants you to have a man, he's going to give you the best man ever. But if you're not focused on him, you're not going to have eyes to see the truth. Guys, if you want a woman that's going to challenge you, is going to push you closer to Jesus, and is going to scare the crap out of you whenever she obeys and prays, you think God's going to trust one of his daughters to you if you're messing around? No. We must be a generation that's surrounded by all of this hedonistic, pleasure-seeking bullcrap that builds our lives on the truth. Focus on building strength in your lives. See yourselves as an asset for the kingdom to be stewarded and valued. This is not about the absence of doing bad things. This is about focusing on what is true and what will build strength. Hey guys, this is Philip Jackson, pastor of young adults at Evergreen Baptist Church. I want to invite you to come to Reach. We meet every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at Evergreen Church in South Tulsa, just east of Mingo on 111th Street. The mission of Reach Tulsa is to cultivate a young adult community that's defined by real transformation and a sincere pursuit of a godly life through training in biblical disciplines, personal development, and intentionally transitioning into independence as mature members of the body of Christ. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to like and subscribe to our content. We're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Reach Young Adult Ministry is a part of Evergreen Baptist Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. For more information and additional lessons, please visit our website, evergreenbc.org.